But when I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. And when I'm broken, and down in nothing I know that you are always up to something good I know that you are always up to something good You'll make a way whatever it takes There's nothing in love won't endure I know darkest night you are on my side you were always faithful through my fear and doubt you will lead me out you were always able through the darkest night you are on my side you were Sunday after Thanksgiving, hope you have a great time giving thanks in all things, through all things. <laughs> Let's just turn our focus to Jesus. Give him all you've got, okay? All you've got. Open up your heart to him right now. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died That stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born And then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, 
Hey, good morning, Hello. Point Church. How Point you guys Church. doing? Hi, hi, hi. Before we get started, yes. I just kind of want to resurrect something really quick. Oh no! Can we res- can we resurrect the um the hawk impression? Oh no! no. <laughs> I think you do your hawk impression, please. Uh, okay, here we go. Here okay. we go. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I didn't expect noises to be thrown in there. It was just hilarious. Oh but, yeah, boy! Our welcome, sound guy's amazing. Welcome. Yes. We we hope you were pleased with that. You can click away now. Just kidding. No, <laughs> yeah, stay here. There's stay more. Here. I tell you. Hey, if you are here for the first time, this is what we do. We have fun, we laugh, and we just carry on. So yes. uh, carry on my wayward son. Let's break into song now. Uh, so, so if you are here for the first time, we have a challenge for you. It's very simple. We say yes. check us out three times, pray, and listen to see if this is where God is asking you to grow spiritually. Yes, yes. And we would love for you uh, just to connect with us on an online connection card that we have for you. It's just found at thepointchurch.net slash connect. And um, on there, you can tell us about the three-point challenge, mm-hmm. but then you can also so um, take any like further steps of faith. So whether it's right. like through um, baptism or it's through just, um, I don't know, you want what, what, to start a relationship, start a relationship with, with Jesus, anything, yeah. anything you want to do, that is definitely a great place to get started and with us. You can take your prayer requests and put them on there. Yes, absolutely. Prayer requests are so, so important we to us. We pray every week. Yes. And so anything you've got going on in your life that you really, really want to just have some extra prayer coverage over, we would love yes. to know. So make sure you, you put that on there as well. Right. And we have focus on the fourth this month. Yes. Yes. It so is- it's... Bed sheets, bed sheets and, and blankets. blankets. Yeah. So I was talking to him earlier about like, why is that so hard for me to say? But it's because I don't say bed sheets. I just say sheets. Sheets and blankets. We went with the bed sheets and blankets for the alliteration. The, for the, <laughs> the alliteration. alliteration of it all. Yeah, so right. I don't know. Do you guys say sheets or do you say bed sheets? Put, it, put in the, in the comments. In the comments. We want to know. So um, yes. Yeah, so make sure you're dropping off your bed sheets and blankets, blankets. here um, on our Bass Road campus. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just at five three three five uh, Bass Road, yep. Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46808. And uh, we will receive those all month long in the month of January. For the rescue mission. Yes. Um, I think that's all. Yeah. You want to go go ahead and pray? I'll pray for sure. Um, Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for this virtual time together. Thank you for the message that's about to um, be delivered from our pastor. God, thank you for the words that you've given him already in advance and how it's going to impact us and change us. We love you. We praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's a psychological phenomenon called inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness happens when we don't see something that exists because we don't expect it to be there. If somebody gets in a car wreck. What do they say? Oh, they came out of nowhere. <laughs> no, no, they didn't come out of nowhere. They were there the whole time. You just didn't expect them. Uh, the same thing happens to me with sunglasses. I go looking through the house. Hey, where are my sunglasses? Where are they? Who, who took them? And my wife goes, honey, your sunglasses are right on top of your head. It's inattentional blindness. You know, one of the best known experiments demonstrating inattentional blindness was the invisible gorilla test carried out by two Harvard professors, Dr. Shabri and Simons. These two researchers asked volunteers to watch a video of a basketball game and count the number of times somebody passed the ball. Afterwards, the volunteers were asked if they noticed anything unusual. 50% half said, no, nothing odd at all, but something odd had happened. A woman dressed in a gorilla suit strolled through the scene, turned to the camera, thumped her chest and walked away, but they didn't see it. Their attention was so focused on the demanding task of counting passes that they missed the invisible gorilla. I was talking to a gamer the other day, a guy in his 20s who was telling me how well he was doing in Call of Duty. And he said, man, the group of guys I play with, we almost won. But but we were so focused on looking for a certain bad guy that we missed another threat. They, they didn't look anything like him. And we lost the game. Now, what caused you loss was inattentional blindness. You know, there's a related concept in psychology called selective attention. Selective attention means you only see what you want to see. You know, those of you that are young and in love... You probably got selective attention. Oh, she's the most beautiful, most wonderful, most perfect, most amazing. Oh, he's the hottest, the buffest, the most intelligent, the greatest. Ask that same couple about their partner in a few years, and they'll have a few more items to report. Some things they missed because they had selective attention. I wonder, friends, what you and I might be missing in our one and only life because of inattentional blindness and selective attention. Have you ever considered that perhaps you're missing opportunities to make a difference in your life and perhaps the lives of others 
What if the opportunity that would alter the next decade of your life was right in front of you and you didn't see it? You were inattentively blind. You were selectively giving attention to the wrong thing. Today, we're launching a brand new series called Unstoppable. It's about the extraordinary power and movement of the Church of Jesus Christ, a movement that was launched because opportunities were not missed and inattentional blindness did not occur. It should have occurred, but let me set the scene for you. In the opening pages of the story of the church, the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes, fills the room, fills the disciples, spills out into the street, and a massive, incredible gathering happens where Peter begins to preach, his very first time to do so, and literally thousands upon thousands of people hear his message and enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if God used you or I to do something like that, I mean, we might get a little puffed up. I mean, we might think we're, we're kind of hot stuff. But Peter, he doesn't become an arrogant egomaniac. I think his humility is really a part of the miracle here. Because his first time preaching, he speaks to thousands and thousands of people. And the minute it's all over, check this out. This happens. Look at Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And Peter said, look at us. One minute, Peter is speaking to thousands and seeing an incredible response. And as he walks to prayer, he sees a beggar, a broken man who's been sitting at this gate begging for money for his entire life. Verse 4, Peter says to him, look at us. And in verse 5, the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. Now, when you study passages like this, when you dive into the fine details of the original language, the Greek, and when you mine the commentaries and pour over the theological journals, what you'll find is that there's an extraordinary amount of research data on where the temple court was, what kind of illness this lame man had from birth, what gate of the 12 gates around the Temple Mount that this lame man was sitting by. And then there are the deep theological arguments about which gate Peter entered. And perhaps all that's helpful, but it's not the point. See, it is so like us humans to argue. Was it an inner gate or an outer gate? How long did it take this lame man to get to where he got? How long did it take for Peter and John to walk to prayer? What really happened at the gate? Friends, this lame man, he was sick from birth. He had lived a life where he was completely ignored, invisible to others. So it's not which gate, it's which God. Listen, the story of the church, it's jam-packed with miracles, the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus ascending into heaven, people who speak different languages, all hearing the truth about Jesus in their own language, the miraculous sermon Peter preached, and the response of thousands to getting saved. It's packed with miracles. But there's a miracle here I don't want you to miss. It's these two men, Peter and John, who've just witnessed all these miracles, who are walking into the temple certainly busy and excited about all the results of what God has done through them. And here's the miracle. They actually see this lame guy. They see him. I mean, the scripture says both Peter and John looked right at him. Friends, if you're like most humans, that's kind of a miracle. And I wonder how many things that God wants us to see that we miss. I wonder how many times our stress, our distraction, our inattentiveness, our focus on self causes us to walk right by the very miracle God has for us? I wonder if we have selective attention towards the wrong things. And I wonder what would happen if, like them, the Holy Spirit moved into our lives so much that we began to see the broken, the beggar, the burden in our lives. Watch what happens in this story. Peter and John, they see this man. Then verse 6, Peter said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, began to walk. He went with them in the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man 
who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, people had walked past this lame man for decades. A lame man who with a hand out. A lame man that just sat at the gate hoping for help. No one met his eyes. I mean, this lame man didn't even look up. He learned over decades of begging that nobody was actually seeing him. Nobody actually cared. So Peter actually has to command him to look at him. And while this man is looking for money, Peter gives him something even better. Peter, just like Jesus, does a miracle and heals him, empowers him miraculously to walk. And not only to walk, but like jump like he's a teenager at a Macklemore concert. Verse 11, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Can I just say like, duh, right there? Of course they were astonished. They, of course they were blown away by this miracle. And I love what Peter does when he sees this crowd like running towards him. He says, okay, we got a crowd. It's time to preach. And verse 12, Peter saw this. He said to him, fellow Israelites, why? Why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? As if by our own power or godliness that we had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. Friends, you killed the author of life. I mean, Peter is looking at them saying, do y'all remember just a little while ago when Jesus came like into town on a donkey and you were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then a few short minutes later, you were saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Y'all remember that? I mean, that's what we're talking about. That guy, that's who you handed over. And what Peter and John are simply saying is this, we all crucify Christ. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't the Jewish elite. It wasn't the Roman occupying force. It was all of us. All of us killed him. And then Peter, he unleashes a whole can of Easter whoop whoop, right? He says, we all killed him. We all put him on the cross. We all crucified Christ. But, but, but this God, this God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. I mean, this stuff will preach, amen? And then Peter says, verse 16, by faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed this guy. And y'all can see that. And Peter's pointing back at that lame guy that's just been healed. He's saying Jesus is alive. His power's real. And it's through that power, not us, that Jesus has this lame man walking. Now, what's going on here? These two men who had just finished preaching before thousands are now focused on the needs of one individual man. The macro is the explosive growth that happened when thousands of people came to Jesus. The micro is noticing one hurting individual the next day. And while the macro is an easy miracle to spot, it's the micro that happens every day. I mean, what would happen to us, church? What would happen if we saw the micro moments of our lives, if we noticed the opportunities that God put into our paths, if we saw the least, the lost, and the lonely? I posit to you that you may be overlooking the miracles you want to see in your life. Like sunglasses on my head, you and I might be suffering from inattentive blindness. Have you ever done an internship? I spent a few years interning under a high-powered lawyer in Sacramento. Fantastic, talented guy. He was a lawyer by day, pastor by night. And he brought me into his law office to help me see what it would look like to be an attorney. Because that was my dream. I wanted to finish up my finance degree, go to law school, join a corporate law firm, make partner, pile up the big bucks, right? So every Monday, I'd show up at his big law office and I'd watch him deal with the intricacies of corporate law. And you know what I discovered? Corporate law is full of conflict. I mean, people are mad at each other, upset about a contract or some deal gone wrong. And every day my mentor was in the middle of every one of those conflicts. Friends, I don't like conflict. Like, I don't care how much money somebody would pay me. I don't want to be in the middle of conflict every day. So why did I want to be a lawyer? Because I thought it was my purpose. I thought it was my calling. I thought it was my dream. But it was a dream that I had invented. It was definitely not God's dream for me. I had inattentive 
blindness. You know, sometimes I wonder if this life is just an internship for the real existence. I wonder if all of our experiences here, all of our trials, all the events, all the pandemics, all the turns left and right are just preparation for eternity. And I wonder if some of us are in the wrong internship. I wonder if some of us are doing the wrong thing. I wonder if some of us have been blinded. We've got selective attention towards a road, a journey that God didn't want us to have. Friends, Peter and John are living in the bullseye of what they are meant to do. Their heart is right. Their direction is right. Their life is right in both the macro and the micro, in both the big and the small. They are seeing all the opportunities that God has for them. What would happen if you and I got in that bullseye? What if we were paying attention to the right things, both big and small? We, friends, if we did that, would change the world. You and I, this church, we'd be unstoppable, unstoppable like a bullet train. We could change the world. Listen, I don't think Peter and John were just anomalies. I don't think that they were just the exceptions to the human rule. I believe they were doing three things that allowed them to see both the macros and the micros, the three things that position them to be the kind of people that God uses. The first of which is right there in verse one. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Where were Peter and John going? They were going to pray. Friends, God uses people who, write this down somewhere, he uses people who live in a pattern of prayer. You know, like I said, the controversies and arguments around this passage, they all center around like which gate they were at, what kind of illness this lame guy had, which are really irrelevant to the passage. What is relevant? What is far more important is what Peter and John are doing before the miracle happens. I mean, if you, you've got to walk through a gate or find a guy with a particular disease to bring about a miracle, well, that's not really reproducible or relevant in our 21st century lives. But what is relevant is what they were headed to do. What were they doing? They were on their way to a three o'clock prayer meeting. They are living in a pattern of prayer. It's what Jesus trained them to do. Before Jesus even picked them as disciples, he spent an entire night in prayer. Have you ever prayed that long? I mean, do you pray long before you make big life decisions? And then how often do you pray? You know, the gospels tell us that Jesus, he's out in the sticks in some tiny little town called Capernaum. But before dawn, Jesus gets up, goes to a quiet place, away from everybody else, to take a moment to pray. Listen, when he's picking leaders, he's praying. When he's alone, he's praying. When he's tempted out in the desert by Satan, he's praying. When the crowds press on him at the lake, he goes to the far shore. Why? To pray. And what does he do at the end of his life in the garden when he's facing this torturous death on the cross? He's praying. You say, well, of course, he's Jesus. He's praying. But Peter and John, they're not Jesus. They're just ordinary dudes. But they've got an extraordinary example who said, you want a life of impact. You want to be a part of an unstoppable church that sees extraordinary miracles. You've got to live in a pattern of prayer. Did they? Well, you read the story of the church, right? Read Acts. They're praying in every chapter because they understood that you can't find your purpose. You can't live your fullest life. You can't get all that you were made to get and made to do. You can't live in the bullseye of God's purpose for you unless, unless you have a pattern of talking to God. See, if you or I were to get up in front of some big crowd and preach to thousands of people, most of us, we'd be praying. We'd be praying the one word prayer like Jonah prayed, right? In the belly of the fish. Help, God, help. I got this big macro-sized opportunity where I need you, God. But prayer is not only for the big moments of life. Peter and John, the reason they saw this invisible lame man is because prayer also shows us the micro opportunities in life. Prayer creates compassion. It softens our heart. And friends, in this COVID season, in this pandemic, we need some softening. Any of you experienced some corona rage? <laughs> maybe some pandemic wrath? You know, maybe the problem is not the virus. Maybe it's not our politicians. Maybe it's our prayer lives. Prayer, it creates compassion. And these men had developed a pattern of prayer. 
Now, the second thing that positioned Peter and John to be the kind of people that God uses is in verse 2. It says, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now, where again were Peter and John going? They were going to pray. They had an agenda. They were going to a meeting, an important meeting, really. I mean, they were going to go meet with God. I mean, how are you when you're going to an important meeting? Most of us, right, we're, we're driven. All we can think about is where we're going, like what we're doing. I mean, we get uber focused and that inattentional blindness sets in. But Peter and John, they were living in the bullseye of God's will. So when this indigent, this lame man, this street guy asked them for money, they don't blow them off. They don't pretend not to see him. Instead, they invite the interruption. This is the second thing that positioned Peter and John to be the kind of people God used, to, to be the kind of people where miracles happen around us. Would you write this down? They not only lived in a pattern of prayer, they invited Jesus interruptions. You know, if you're wired like me, you probably hate interruptions. You know, every study shows interruptions are like bad for the brain. Like interruptions terrorize business profits. They choke your studies, your grades. They cause trouble in your marriage and your relationships. I mean, interruptions, they're just awful. I remember studying for finals in college. And, and did you guys like have one of those friends like I did who like right in the middle of your studies ask you over and over to do stuff? Ray, want to play some hoop? Dude, I'm studying. I got like a final in the morning. 10 minutes later. Hey, Ray, how about we go get some pizza? You want to go get some pizza? Dude, I'm like laser focused right now and studying for this microeconomics final. And if you don't stop interrupting me, I'm going to flunk and I'm going to have to live like, like in a van down by the river. You know, I thought when I got older, this kind of thing would get better. But then I had kids. Any of you kids ever interrupt your parents? Yeah, you do. Dad, 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 dad. What? I don't know. I forgot. Man, I get text messages like this now, 17 times, dad, 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 interruptions. But you know, not all interruptions are bad interruptions. And that's sometimes hard for me to keep in mind. But I want to think all interruptions are anathema, right? But not all interruptions are bad ones. Sometimes Jesus interrupts you. I was talking to a sales guy who was having lunch at a fast food place pre-COVID, you know, when you could actually go in and sit down in the restaurant. And he noticed this teenage kid sitting nearby with nothing but a few crackers in front of him. And he said, Ray, I was busy with my job, but I sensed Jesus telling me to buy this kid some lunch. So I did. And the kid he just started opening up about his life, that his dad had just kicked him out of the house, that he hadn't eaten for two days. And this kid just spilled out all these feelings while he's scarfing down this meal that I had bought for him. And he says, Ray, the cool thing was I got to be used by God that day to really speak truth into the life of that teenager because I was open to the interruption. Listen, Jesus has interruptions for you every day. And while you might be miffed about all the interruptions you get from like social media or your kids or your coworkers, you will never, ever regret paying attention to an interruption from Jesus. Being used by God, it starts with living in a pattern of prayer. It continues by being open to Jesus' interruptions. And here's the final thing that you and I've got to do if we want to see God do miracles through us, if we want to be used by God in an unstoppable way. It's in verse 4. Then Peter said, look at us. And the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter says, no, no, no. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Would you write this down if you got paper somewhere? If you want to be used by God, you got to lift up Jesus. Lift up Jesus above all else. See, if Jesus is interrupting, make sure it's Jesus you're lifting up. You know, often when I read a story like this one in the scriptures, I ask myself, Ray, how would you have reacted there? I mean, if God had used me on the day of Pentecost to grow the church by thousands in a single message, and then the very next day used me to do a miracle to help this lame man walk, what would that do to my psyche, my, my emotions, my ego? Now, I'd like to think I'd do okay, but I think it's kind of naive to say that, to say that I would have handled it as smoothly as Peter and John did. You know, I might be tempted to go like, hey, it's time to write a book and make a movie. I'll get Brad Pitt to have a starring role as Pastor Ray. Or like maybe just speak at conferences and seminars about the one time in my life where God used me to launch the church or do that miracle thing. 
you know, sometimes, friends, we, we lift up the wrong person. We lift ourselves up and not Jesus. But Peter and John, they didn't let these miracles go to their head. They weren't focused on that one moment in their life where God used them. They lifted up Jesus and they spent the rest of their life doing more and more and more miracles. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, hey, Ray, why don't we see more miracles today? And my response is this. Perhaps there's not enough people with the character God desires to use. Perhaps most people are just in it for themselves. Maybe it's time to humble ourselves. You know, God, he's protective of his miracles. Because God knows that ego is dangerous and damaging. And if we take the credit for his glory, even once, what will the damage be to our lives and the relationships around us? These men, they, they literally said, don't give us the credit. Don't look at us and think we did this. What would happen, friends, if you and I dropped to our knees, humbled ourselves, opened our lives for Jesus' interruptions, and then said, hey, God, whatever happens, I'm going to give you all the credit and all the glory. I mean, what if, friends? That on the heels of this pandemic, this year, that God brings about a revival of spirit and a growth in his church that is so big, no one person could possibly take credit for it. And what if that movement of God so massively transforms our nation and our culture that no talking head on TV, no professor, no doctor, no sociologist, no psychologist can ever explain it away? Friends, if you and I, if we would all just give God the glory, do you know what would happen? We would become unstoppable. Jesus' compassion would become our compassion, and we would see things we've never seen before. Our eyes would be open to the interruption of God, and he would pour out his grace. You see, how did they do what they did? Well, they had selective attention, but their selective attention wasn't on the political scene or the cultural chaos or on their preferences or desires, their fears or their finances. Their selective attention was on Jesus Christ and what he could do. Let you and I put our focus in the same place. In fact, let's do that right now in prayer. Right now, let's give our selective attention to Jesus. Right now, wherever you're at, would you just pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life. Thank you for coming to the earth. Thank you for dying on the cross. I receive your forgiveness. Would you pray that? Say, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Now make me your follower every day in every way. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, you prayed the most important thing anyone could pray. And I want to encourage you. Keep watching. Keep walking. Keep going after God. Pray. Look for that Jesus interruption and open your heart and mind. And when God starts to move and you see miracles occur, give him all the credit and all the glory. Oh, God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Would you make us unstoppable in the name of Christ? Amen. Hey, thank you, friends, for taking time to worship with us. In fact, if you just pray that prayer, would you take a quick moment and put hashtag Jesus in the feed right now? Hashtag Jesus, if you just prayed that. Man, we'd love to help you take your next step. Here's Deanna with the details. Yes, thank you so much, Ray. I'm so thankful for that message. If you're thankful too and you're ready to get plugged in and stay plugged in, um, go ahead and put in hashtag unstoppable into the feed. We would love to know that we are gonna be doing this journey together for our new series. I love it. Now, if you've also, if you've just made a decision to trust Jesus for the very first time today, please let us know. The Bible tells us that there is rejoicing in heaven because you've made that decision. A literal like party is going on right now. So I just I just want to be invited to the party. So would you please invite us to the party? Would you uh, please, please, please? We would love to just celebrate with you um, and with heaven and really just be able to connect you with uh, resources. And we would love to be able to help you take your next step. So all good things. Congratulations if you've made that decision. Again, as Ray said, hashtag Jesus in the feed will let us know that you made that decision. Hashtag Jesus is a celebration. And it's an invitation to the party. And if you've been hanging out with us for uh, the first time today, thank you so much. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, we would love to know if it is your first time, head over to the pointchurch.net slash connect and just tell us there or even let us know in the chat box below. We love, love, love 
meeting and connecting with new folks, we um, actually have a free gift for you. It's an ebook on marriage and family that we released from our pastor, Ray Harris, the fellow that you just heard from. So let us know that you're new and where we can send this ebook to you. Um, and it's just a gift it's just to show you some love and uh, just for being our guest today. Finally, if you'd like to partner with The Point Church through giving, we've made it very, very simple. Um, give in person here at our Bass Road campus anytime Monday through Thursday, nine to six. Our staff will actually be here in the building ready to receive your gift. Or you can totally do the electronic route. Um, click over to thepointchurch.net slash give, and there you'll be able to give through credit or debit. Also, if you haven't tried the text to give option, I'm telling y'all, it only takes a minute or two to set it up. And then after that, it's 20 seconds to give when you're ready. I love it so much. It's my favorite. So like and follow all the places if you haven't yet, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and thank you in advance for doing that. We love staying connected with you. I'll see you next week. Bye.